Hello learners, today we are going to review everything you've ever done with lines. So we're going to be traveling at a good pace. Remember, if you need to ask me questions, please do. So I want to re uh, remind you that there are four basic types of lines. We have lines that rise or lines that increase. It's a better word for it when you get to pre-calculus. And those lines have a positive slope positive slope is designated by saying that m is greater than zero. We also have lines that fall, all right, and we'll say those lines are decreasing. Lines that fall have a negative slope, and we can say the slope is less than zero, slope is negative. We also have horizontal lines. Those lines have zero slope, so you say m equals zero. We also have lines that are vertical. These lines are not functions because they do not pass the vertical line test, but all of the other types of lines are functions. And here we say that the slope is undefined. M is undefined. So we are going to do a few slope questions. These are the questions that we're going to do. If you want to pause the video and write these into your notes, leave space, and then we'll get going together. So if you have a line that passes through the points negative 2, 4, and 10, negative 7, you can plug into the old Algebra 1 formula, m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Remember, that's just saying that the slope is rise over run, where rise is the difference in y's and run is the difference in x's. So I don't set up that formula like I would have been Algebra 1. Now I'm going to move faster, but I'm also always going to do my algebra based on graphical interpretation. So I can quickly say that negative 2 comma 4 is going to be left 2 up 4. And if I'm just trying to get, it, uh, to get an image of a line, but I don't need a great deal of precision, it is absolutely fine just to quick plot the points without doing all the tick marks. And then 10 negative 7 is going to be right 10 and down 7. So without doing a whole lot of work, I can initially immediately see that the slope is negative. So I'm going to say m equals negative. Don't just write a fraction floating on your paper. Label it m equals. Communicate clearly. That is a big deal in pre-calculus. Now when I do rise, I'm going to look from 4 to negative 7, if I counted on the number line, that would span a total of 11 steps. And run goes from negative 2 to 10. And again, on the number line, that would cover a total of 12 steps. Negative 11 twelfths does not reduce, so I'm done. If I give you the equation of a line, I want you to be able to name the slope. Well, guys, this is y equals mx plus b form, right? So just because it's important to review, it doesn't mean it's difficult. So the slope is just 5. But remember, whereas this y equals mx plus b form, um, which is slope-intercept form, is easy, this is ax plus by equals c standard form. So I can't look at this and just go, oh, there's the slope. So there's two ways to do it. Let's review the way that doesn't require any memorization. If I rewrite standard form into slope intercept form, then that means I simply isolate y. So when I divide by negative 4, my new equation is y equals positive 5 fourths x plus 7. Now I can say, oh, the slope is 5 fourths. Again, label m equals because that's what you were asked to find, so be clear about your answer. Now, there is another way to do the slope if you've got standard form. So this is quicker, but it requires memorization. And so if you're in a hot pressure situation like the ACT and you might forget some of your formulas, just do it the old school way where you're not going to forget. But in class, when it's lower pressure, you can probably do the faster way. And that's to just know that the slope is always going to be negative A over B 
when you're working with standard form. So in our example, negative A is five, or negative five, and B is negative four, so negative five over negative four is going to be that positive five fourths. And that is an A-OK -okay way to do it um, on a regular basis. So the last slope question we're going to answer is, what about when lines are parallel to or perpendicular to a given line? So here I want you to answer both questions. Remember, if this is the given line, I can say, hey, this guy is in standard form. So my slope is negative A over B, and that does not reduce. Now I can say, oh, so the slope of a parallel line, and my shorthand um, notation for that is the parallel slope. It's not really a parallel slope, it's the slope of the parallel line, but this is the way I label it quickly, is negative four sevenths as well. Remember, the slopes of parallel lines are the same. And the slope of a perpendicular line is, remember, going to be the opposite reciprocal. The slopes of perpendicular lines are opposite reciprocals of each other. So that would be opposite means instead of negative positive, and reciprocal means seven fourths. So there's your quick review on slope. Now we're going to look at writing the equations of lines that are vertical and horizontal because these are really really quick and so what I want you to do is sketch the lines and you'll know exactly what the equation then is just by looking at the picture in one step. Pause the video if you want to and write down these examples in your notes. So what's the, uh, the equation of a line that passes through 9 negative 7 and 9 4? Well as I mentioned we are going to quickly sketch. Now, I don't need a great deal of precision with this kind of thing, so I'm not going to worry about doing tick marks. So I know 9 negative 7 is right 9 down 7. 9 4 would be right 9 up 4. So I quickly sketch the points and see that my line is vertical. So once you recognize that your line is vertical or horizontal, the answer to the equation of the line is a one-step snappy kind of thing. So I'm just going to go, oh, look, this line passes through the x-axis at x equals 9. So how do I write the equation of the line that passes through 1 comma negative 8, but is parallel to our previous line, so parallel to the line x equals 9? Well, 1 negative 8 is right 1 down 8. Parallel to the previous line is also vertical. So again, the minute I see that I've got a vertical line, it's going to pass through the x-axis at x equals 1, and that's all there is to it. So here's a tougher problem, and sometimes students think there's no way they can do this, but you can because you took geometry. So when a line is tangent to a circle, you learn some things in geometry about this. So my drawing is not great, but it'll be good enough, I think, for you to remember. So I'm going to sketch a circle, and believe me, drawing is not my forte, but there's a, a, a decent circle. And then I'm going to just pick a point on the circle, and I'm going to try to sketch the line that's tangent to. Now remember, tangent to means the line touches the circle in one and only one point. It doesn't pierce the circle because if it pierced the circle, number one, it would be called a secant line. Number two, it would pierce the circle at two separate points. Now remember, if I point out the center of the circle and I draw the radius that goes from the center to the point of tangency, do you see the relationship that you learned in geometry? If you're saying, oh yeah, the radius and the tangent line must be perpendicular, at the point of tangency, you're right. Now you need to remember this so that your drawings are accurate and you're able to do problems like I just mentioned. So I'm doing double duty here because I'm reminding you how to read the equation of a circle. Remember, the equation of a circle is in the form a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It's in Pythagorean theorem format, which we're going to review in a day or two. 
So this tells me, x minus one squared tells me that the center of my circle is at positive one comma, y plus two squared tells me that the center of the circle is at negative two. The nine tells me that the radius of my circle is three. So I can sketch a decent circle. Guys, I am no Leonardo da Vinci. I try to be neat, which is what I'm gonna ask you to do, but it will definitely not be perfect. Now on this one, it's a little more important to be precise with your graph, so I'm actually making tick marks. So the radius is three units long, so I'm gonna count from the center three units right, three units left, three units up, and three units down. And I'm gonna to attempt to draw a decent circle. Okay, so there's my circle. Uh, use your imagination because it doesn't quite look round. But it says we want the line that is tangent to the circle at the point one one. Well, here's the point one one. One one, if you connect to the center of the circle, creates a vertical radius. So since the line of tangency and the radius must be perpendicular, perpendicular to a vertical line is a horizontal line. Oh, there we go. So when I draw the picture, now I know that what I'm doing is writing the equation of a horizontal line. Horizontal lines cut through the y-axis and it's gonna cut through the y-axis at the y-coordinate one. So there's a quick review of writing the equations of horizontal and vertical lines. Now we're gonna write the equation of diagonal lines. These require more work. So with horizontal lines and vertical lines, once you graph them, you can see the axis that they pass through and their equations are either X equals or Y equals a number. So Horizontal and vertical lines have either an X or a Y in their equation. Diagonal lines, however, have both X and Y in the equation. And with diagonal lines, we start with point slope form. So if you wanna jot down the following problems, these are the ones that we'll do the scratch work for. So pause the recording if you need to and jot them down in your notes. So one of the things I'm showing you is, how do you write down the given information? Remember, whenever you do your homework, the first point of partial credit is to record the given information. So I'm recording that the line passes through 0, 10 and has a slope of 2 fifths, but I'm not writing the directions. I don't need you to write the directions. Well, on this one, remember point slope form, is y minus your y coordinate. So I'm gonna say y sub n to remind you this is where you plug in a number for y, equals m times x minus your x coordinate. So I'm saying x sub n, it's where you plug in a number for x. So I could do that here. I could say y minus 10 equals 2 fifths times x minus zero. And of course that's y minus 10 equals, x minus zero is just x. So it's just two fifths times x. Y equals two fifths x plus 10. Now let me make a note here. On this one, you could have bypassed point slope form because I gave you the y intercept. So if you would just use the y intercept and gone straight to slope intercept form, that is a okay on this particular problem. So on our next problem, the line's gonna pass through the point negative seven, negative four, and the information says that the slope is four thirds. So when the slope is positive, I know that the line is rising, i.e. the line's diagonal. So I know my equation's gonna have two letters in it, and I'm gonna start with point slope form. So y minus y sub n would be y minus a negative four or y plus four equals four thirds times x minus x sub n, x minus a negative seven, x plus seven. Now you can work if you want to with the fractions as they are, or you can clear fractions. 
let's review clearing fractions. So I'm going to multiply everything by 3. When I do 3 times y plus 4, I get 3y plus 12. When I do 3 times 4 thirds times x plus 7, because I'm multiplying both sides of the equation by 3, the 3's cancel, and I simply distribute the 4, and I get 4x plus 28. FYI, guys, I usually skip this step. I don't write it. I think through it, but I don't write that step so that you can have more minimal steps, and that's fine. So 3y equals 4x plus 28. Let's see here. 28 minus 12 is what, 16? So y equals 4 thirds x plus 16 thirds. Now, let me mention something. You can end your equations in either slope intercept form or standard form, and that's okay. Some people feel like they've always got to go to slope intercept form because we like it. It's a nice, neat form. But look here, right here, I could have said, well, standard form means to put your x's on the left, your y's on the left, the y was already on the left, and simply put the plain number on the right. So 28 minus 12 would be 16. And I could have stopped with that form. By the way, with standard form, there's always two okay ways to write it. So I could have also said, I don't want to lead with a negative. So I could have flip-flopped my signs and said 4x minus 3y equals negative 16. So there are really three good ways you could have answered the equation for that line, and I would have given you credit. Remember, standard form does not contain fractions. So the most difficult type of line you can write the equation for is one where I'm talking about a line being parallel or perpendicular to another. It's really not difficult. Parallel and perpendicular to are concepts about slope. And if you're going to point, plug in the point slope form, you need a point. And in this case, you've got one, three comma two, and a slope. Well, I can get a slope real quickly. So remember, the given line is in standard form. And I know I could say m equals negative a over b. Ah, so m equals 3. Well, that's cool. Now, I need the line that's perpendicular to that one. So this, uh, oops, sorry about that. So the slope of the perpendicular line, which I shorthand call the perpendicular slope, is the opposite reciprocal of the slope of the given line. So now if I want to go into point slope form, I simply use the point that I was given and the slope that I was given. So I'm going to say y minus 2 equals negative 1 third x minus 3. Now the last time I cleared fractions, this time I'm just going to work with them. So y minus 2 equals negative 1 third x and negative 1 third times negative 3 is positive 1. So this one actually was neat y equals negative one-third x plus three. And again, had you wanted to end in standard form, you could have. Let me mention one more thing that sometimes confuses people because um, people want to make it too difficult. The given line um, has a slope of negative one-third, okay? And on the given line, I could have said, well, if I plug in zero for x, then I would have had 2y equals negative 12 and y equals negative 6. So I could have graphed the given line really quickly. And the slope of that line was 3. So up 1, 2, 3, right 1. So the given line I'll often graph dotted. And then your job is always to find the slope of the, or the equation of the line that you don't have already, and I'll make it solid. So my new line starts at three comma two. A lot of people confuse that you've got to, um, to graph the new line, you've got to already know the y-intercept. That's not true. You need any point in the slope. So from any point in the line, I could then count the slope. So I already knew my slope was um, negative one third. So from here, I can go down one 
and write one, two, three. Now, my graph is not perfect because I'm not using a straight edge, nor am I using graph paper. But does it look like the um, y intercept of my new line could possibly be at three? Yeah, it's not perfect. But yeah, where that line's crossing the y um, axis, it does look like it might, might be zero, three. So again, this is a way to make sure that what I'm graphing and then what I'm doing algebraically, they seem to correspond to each other. Now we're going to look at applications of lines. And these are on page 36 or 37 in your book. I think some of these are homework problems, so I'm gonna help you get started. One of the biggest problems people have is they don't know what to write down as the given information. So we're gonna work on that piece of the, of the problem solving. So on this one, this is a um, word problem about depreciation. So the value of an item is decreasing with time. So a sub shop purchases a used pizza oven for $875. Now you need to interpret, they're telling you that when the pizza oven is new to them, when zero time has passed, then the value of the oven is $875. So you would record that on your given information as having the point zero, 875. Now let me stop here and remind you of something. If you're going to write the equation of a line, you either need two points on the line or you need a point and a slope. So when you read word problems, read them and decide, is this word problem giving me two points or is it giving me a point and a slope? Many of them are actually giving you two points. It will be giving you a slope if it gives you a rate of change. So it might tell you that the value of an item increases at a rate of $300 every seven years. That would be a rate of change. Rates are always have something per something. So miles per hour or miles per gallon or feet per second. Those are rates, so that's slope information. That's not what we have in this problem though. This one says after five years, the oven will have to be replaced. Now we have to make an inference. After five years that the oven must be replaced, we're saying its value, at least to us, is zero dollars. So in five years, I have a value of zero dollars. Now value depends on time. Let me remind you, Y always depends on X. X is your independent variable. Y is your dependent variable. Y depends on X. Here, the value of the oven depends on the oven's age or how much time has elapsed since you got the oven. So that's telling you that time is your X coordinate and value is your Y coordinate. So if you have to end your equation in Y equals MX plus B, Remember, you're gonna start in point slope form most often. That's telling you that your equation should end with not y equals mx plus b, but v equals mt plus b, because we're going to use the letters the word problem assigns. So that should get you started. You've already seen an example of how to write an equation that gives you two points. So you'll find the slope, and then you'll go to point slope form. Wait. Do you have to go to point slope form on this particular problem? No, because I'm actually giving you the y intercept. So once you find the slope, go straight to slope intercept form. Now, the next problem I want to go over is number 129 about college enrollment. So, Penn State University has enrollments of around 40,000 students in the year 2000 and 44,000 students in the year 2008. Well guys, that's giving you two individual points. So I can tell that enrollment is increasing over time if the enrollment is modeled by linear growth. And if it says something about linear growth, it's saying, hey, write the equation of a line, use point slope form. So when I read that there are 40,571 students in the year 2000, careful, what you have is that 
enrollment will depend on time. So enrollment has to be your X coordinate. Time has to be your Y coordinate. Well, I might have started out writing the year as 2000 and the enrollment is the 40,000 number. But when I read the problem, it says let T equal zero correspond to the year 2000. So instead of having 2000 comma 40,571, I quickly change it and simplify it to the year zero comma 40,571. This is awesome because it makes your number smaller to work with and it just gave you a Y intercept, which means in a minute you'll be able to go straight to slope intercept form and you can bypass point slope form. That's a good thing. So now I know a little more. I need to say, oh, well then the year 2008 would be represented by the X coordinate eight and that would be correspond to 44,112 students. So there's my second point. So what do you write down for your given information? Just these two points, that's all, okay? Don't write the whole word problem. Don't write the directions. Just write the points that you need. That's an art form for you to figure out how to write your given information, just like that. So that's what we're working on. And then you know how to write the equation of line that passes through two points because we just went over that. So we already know that the year um, T equals zero represents the year 2000. That's why I have zero and eight, not 2000 and 2008. And we need to end in y equals mx plus b form. Now, if enrollment depends on the year, enrollment is your y value. So I'm using s for students. You could use e for enrollment, or you could even use n for number of students because they don't specify what letter to use there. So any of those would have made perfect sense. And I'm going to use t for time. Time is often your X coordinate in word problems. That's pretty typical. So instead of Y equals MX plus B form, my Y is going to be S equals MT plus B form. So we'll make sure that our final equations have the letters that correspond to the word problem. One last one and you're done with your review of lines. So now this is one, it's a great problem and we're going to build on this kind of thing later because we're really going to get into problems that are, deal with um, revenue, profit, and cost because that's a real common business application that you'll see in calculus. Um, so you'll see several of those kinds of problems throughout pre-calculus. But the thing that I wanted to show you this problem for is because a lot of people jump and they want to reverse what the X and what the Y coordinates are. So a real estate office handles an apartment complex that has a total of 50 apartments, 50 units. When the rent per unit is $580 per month, all 50 apartments will be rented, all 50 units are occupied. So when the rent, when the rent's $580, there are at least 50 people in line to rent those apartments. So guys, a lot of people will instantly say, oh, 50 comma 580, because there's something that we think that the X coordinate's small and the Y coordinate's large. That's what feels normal. But here it's the other way around. All right. So when they charge $580, as a result, there are 50 people who want to rent the apartments. So then when they increase the rent to $625, only 47 people want to rent the apartments maybe the rent's too expensive so three people have to drop out of line so you know now that that's going to be 625 dollars comma 47. now it says that you should assume that the relationship between the monthly rent and the demand is linear if you see the word linear it means that we are writing the equation of a line so i would not have chosen these letters but they did not ask me so they're saying let rent be p and let the number of apartments rented be X, I would probably say R for rent and N for the number of apartments or A for apartments or even U for units, the way they're saying it. But that tells us that we are going to have rent comma number of apartments rented. And so now my Y equals MX plus B form is going to take on X equals MP plus B form. 
That's not what I would use, but that is the way that it would look in this particular word problem. You all ought to be able to do the problem from there. Because again, if you've got two points on a line, then you know um, how to find the slope and write the equation of the line with point slope form. So FYI guys, um, writing these two points and then writing the P comma X is a good practice to get into because it emphasizes the points that the line passes through and the letters that you're using for X and Y traditionally. We are now going to switch gears and we're going to talk briefly about what it means for a point to be a solution of an equation. And that's going to lead us into a short discussion of intercepts, short but important. So if I want to test whether a solution or a point is a solution of an equation, I have to think about it two different ways. Number one, if x, y is a solution of an equation, it means when you plug x and y into the algebraic equation, it fits, all right? So that means it satisfies the equation algebraically. But you also need to know that means if I were to graph the equation, my x, y point would be on the graph. So you've got two ways you're thinking about it, algebraically and graphically. So if you want to jot down these two problems, these are the ones we're going to do scratch work for. You can pause the video if you need to. So on the first example, I'm giving you the graph or the equation of a square root function. Remember square root functions, if I were to graph this quickly, now you don't have to know this at this point, but you will notice that I'm all the time reviewing things that you've seen to get you back up to speed. Square root functions are the ones that are, look like half a parabola, but the x plus 4 tells you that you're going to move left 4 from 0, 0 to negative 4, 0, and then the general shape of your square root functions like that. So I'm asking you, is 0, 2 going to satisfy this equation and be on this graph? And is 5, 3 going to satisfy this equation and be on this graph? That's really what I'm asking you. Let me erase that so I have room to work. You know, I told you, handy dandy socks. Socks are great for your erasers. So I'm going to do the work with you. So I simply say, well, in place of Y, I plug in 2. In place of my X, I plug in 0. 2 equals the square root of 4. Is that true? Yes. Now, the square root of 4, guys, is 2. You don't say that the square root of four equals plus or minus two. The only time you would have a situation like that is if I said, tell me what is plus or minus the square root of four equal, and then you would say plus or minus two. When someone asks you to find the square root, they only mean the principal or the positive square root. And you don't get the plus or minus situation unless you're solving a quadratic equation. So now I'm going to say, well, is five three a solution of this equation. So for y, I plug in 3. For x, I plug in 5. So 3 equals the square root of 9. 3 equals 3. So yes. Now what have I figured out? I figured out that 5 comma 3 would be a point on that square root function that I sketched. 0 comma 2 would also be a point on the square root function I sketched. And by the way, Remember the square root function I sketched look like this. Now I know that this point is 0, 2. And I know that this point is negative 4, 0. So when we start talking about intercepts in another couple of slides, I can say that the x-intercept is negative 4, 0, and the y-intercept is 0, 2 because that's where we're headed. Now we're going to see if 1, 5, and 6, 0 are solutions of this absolute value equation. While we're at it, let's talk about, do you know how to graph the absolute value equation? Do you remember absolute value equations are always V-shaped? Now it might help you if we rewrite it like this. This might feel like a more natural order. 
So I can tell that the absolute value graph is upside down and I'm gonna move it right two and up four. So I'll do a quick sketch. And again, I'm just doing some extra stuff to get you back into the habit of thinking about math. So right two, up four, and then I said it was upside down and the understood slope is negative one. So that would be down one, out one in both directions. So there's my absolute value graph. So I'm doing double duty, I'm reviewing you, but I'm also talking about solutions. So let's see, is one comma five going to line up on that absolute value graph? I don't know, let's see. So I'm gonna plug one five into this equation. So Y would be five, X would be one. Now, one minus two is negative one, and the absolute value of negative one is positive one. But that gives you five equals three. Since that is not true, I'm saying no, one comma five is not a solution of the equation. And I could see, even with my not so hot sketch, one comma five would be up here, and that's clearly not on that V shape. Now what about six zero? So again, I'm plugging into this equation. So Y goes in, zero goes in for Y, four minus the absolute value of six for X minus two, zero equals four minus, six minus two is four, and the absolute value of four is four. So that's zero equals zero. So that's true. So yes, it is a solution. Up here, I should have said yes, yes. I didn't actually answer the question, sorry about that. So yes, uh, zero or six zero is a solution of the graph or the equation. That also means it's going to be a point on this V shape. So this isn't perfect, but if I were to continue my graph, that's a little bit better. Then I could say that's three, four, five. That must be six zero right there. I kind of made it look like it was right. Oh, and remember, that's telling you that six zero is not only a solution, that six zero is the x-intercept of the graph. So here's the general idea, guys. You can always find enough solution points um, by making a table of values or a t-chart that you could plot a whole bunch of points that actually satisfy an equation algebraically, knowing that those points connected form a graph. The problem is, that that can be really time consuming. Furthermore is if the graph is complex. So as we go through pre-calculus and calculus, you're gonna see weirder and wilder graphs. And those graphs can have subtle characteristics um, that if you don't plot enough points or the absolute correct points, you may not see all the details that the graph um, exhibits, all the characteristics. So what we're going to do instead, when we talk about graphing, we're going to try to pick some characteristics to identify and graph from there. So a main characteristic to talk about is the intercepts of the graph. Other characteristics would be to find if the graph exhibits symmetry. Does the graph increase or decrease? Is the graph monotonic? Does the graph have any max points or min points? Is the graph smooth or differentiable? Is the graph continuous? All of these questions are questions that we're going to begin answering in pre-calculus, and we'll continue this discussion as you get into calculus. So our first characteristics that we're gonna talk about in this chapter are intercepts, which we're about to do, and symmetry. So jot this down for sure. It doesn't matter if you've ever seen a particular equation before, or if it's familiar or unfamiliar, when you ask yourself, or well, what are the x-intercepts, then follow this pattern. Whenever you want x-intercepts, you plug in y equals zero, because x-intercepts are on an x-axis, and any point on the x-axis has a y-coordinate of zero. If you want y-intercepts, which fall on the y-axis, and y, uh, points on the y-axis have a zero x-coordinate, then you plug in x equals zero and you solve for y. 
So that works regardless of whether the graph is a line or an absolute value graph, or it's a parabola or some crazy graph you've never even conjured up in your imagination. So we're going to do four intercept problems and I'm gonna show you how I want you to show your work. And then this lesson is done for the day. Jot these down if you want to ahead of time so you can more uh, easily keep up with me. We're going to do scratch work. So our first equation that we're gonna check out is six X minus nine Y equals three. With X to the first and Y to the first, you ought to recognize that's just a line. That's the standard form of a line. So you've seen this. Now I'm gonna label my work guys. I'm gonna be clear. Right now I'm gonna work on X intercept. Then I'll work on Y intercept. It doesn't take but a second to label well and that makes your communication clear. And communication is a, is a key thing that is an objective that we're developing in this pre-calculus class. So I'm supposed to plug in zero for, or, uh, for an X intercept, I'm supposed to plug in zero for Y, solve for X. So plug in zero for Y, which makes it just reduced down to six X equals three. Solve for X, X equals three sixths or one half. So when you're done with your intercepts, answer in point form. So that gives you one half comma zero is your X intercept. Same thing for the Y intercept. Y intercept, you plug in zero for X, solve for Y. So plug in zero for X, solve for Y. So my equation immediately reduces down to negative nine Y equals three. Y is gonna be uh, three over negative nine or negative one third. And as a point, I say that zero negative one third and I'm done. Our next equation is Y equals two to the X minus eight. So this equation is an exponential function. Whether you remember those or not, it's not the issue. There's a very straightforward way to find the X and Y intercepts. And that's my point. Same process works regardless of what type of equation or what type of graph you're dealing with. So when I find the X intercept, I plug in zero for Y and solve for X. So I plug in zero for Y and solve for X. So this is the resulting equation. Oh, that means to do two to the X equals eight. So two to what power equals eight? That's right, two to the third equals eight. So that means my X intercept is three, zero. Now my Y intercept, that's when I plug in zero for X and solve for Y. So zero for X and solve for Y. Well, two to the zero power is one, and one minus eight is equal to negative seven. Okay, so that means my X was zero and my Y turned out to be negative seven. It's not supposed to be difficult. So your next to the last example for this lesson. I wanna find the X and Y intercepts of this rational equation. It's a rational function because remember in a math class, rational means fractional. So if you have an equation that's fractional with X's in the denominator, it's rational. If it's just got fractional coefficients with no X's in the denominator, it's not rational, but this one is. So if I wanna find the X intercept, then I simply say, all right, I've got to plug in zero for Y and then solve for X. Now, some people wanna make this more difficult than it needs to be but we're gonna go over and over and over this. And whereas right now you might feel weird about this, you're, this is gonna be one of those things that you quickly grow into and you're gonna be able to go, wow. I mean, like I'm thinking much um, more maturely um, just in a couple of weeks. So here's the deal. If I want an entire fraction to reduce to zero, remember zero over some number is equal to zero, all right? But if you have some number over zero, that fraction's undefined. So I don't want the denominator to be zero. And if you have zero over zero, that's actually called the indeterminate form of a fraction, which we're gonna talk about the very last chapter of pre-calculus. So this isn't your issue. So my point here is if I want this whole fraction to reduce to zero, 
the top specifically must be zero. So I rewrite this problem as x squared minus 16 equals zero. Um, and then you can go, okay, that's the same thing as saying x squared equals 16. And if I take the square root of both sides, remember when you take the square root of both sides, you have to introduce the plus or minus. So I get two x-intercepts. One of your x-intercepts is at four zero, and the other x-intercept is at negative four zero. So on your y-intercepts, they're usually easier. This is where you solve for y by plugging in zero for x. So zero squared is zero minus 16 over three times zero is zero plus one. Well, that just gives you the fraction negative 16 over one, which reduces to negative 16. So instead of solving for a while on this problem, I'm really just evaluating. But I said zero for x, negative 16 for y, and there's your answer. So the last equation, 5x squared minus 3xy plus 2y cubed equals 20. Yikes, what kind of equation is that? When have you ever dealt with something that has an x squared and a y cubed? You haven't. You've dealt with equations that have x squareds and y squareds. Those are called conics, where they might be circles, they might be hyperbolas, they might be ellipses, which we're also going to talk about in a few days. But you've not dealt with anything that has an x squared and a y cubed nor will you. You won't grasp something crazy like this until you're in calculus. But that doesn't mean you can't find the x and y intercepts. That's the whole point of this discussion. Finding the x and the y intercepts is the same regardless of whether you have a simple or a complex equation. So for the x intercepts, I want to plug in zero for y. So 5x squared minus 3x times zero plus two times zero cubed equals 20. We'll notice these two terms zero out, so my equation shrinks to five x squared equals 20. That's not difficult. X squared equals four and X equals plus or minus two, okay? So that means I have two X intercepts, one at two zero and one at negative two zero. So now for the Y intercept, I'm gonna do similarly so plug in zero for x, solve for y. Well, if I plug zero into the five x squared, that term is going to zero out of the problem. If I plug in zero for the negative three x y term, it'll also zero out of the problem. So all I get left is two y cubed equals 20, which means y cubed equals 10, which means y equals the cube root of 10. Remember, if you take the cube root or the fifth root or odd roots of both sides of an equation, that plus or minus thing isn't a thing. That plus or minus is only when you take an even root of both sides of an equation. So I only have one y-intercept, which I should, because if I had two y-intercepts, my graph would not be a function. It would fail the vertical line test. So zero comma cube root of 10 is my y-intercept. You are now ready to get going on the homework assignment.